My theme is the future of learned societies. Now, the learned society goes back several hundred years. We believe we know that the Royal Society in London published the first thing we call a scholarly journal in 1665. And one of the things learned societies do is publish journals. Indeed, the reason I could be sure I would be able to meet this obligation in New York and not be sucked off on some other provostial trip is that I'm here for the board meeting of the American Council of Learned Societies. And one of the criteria that we have for membership in the ACLS to determine whether something is a learned society is indeed whether it publishes a journal. And how you administer that technical requirement is an interesting one in these, uh, in these days. Now, one respectable move of the last decade or so has been to dismiss the internet generically, dismiss the kind of stuff you find on the internet, and for want of a better word, bury your head in the sand, comfortable and confident that the transactions of the American Philological Association, for example, will be able to save you from having to take any such thing seriously. Here's where my trip to India and some other contacts in the last year give me pause. Uh, the liveliest moment of the International Conference on Academic Libraries in India was when the argument broke out uh, among the participants on the question whether the internet is a library or not. I think I am happy to say that the majority prevailed in arguing that the internet is not a library. And most of you could reproduce the argument that would be made to demonstrate that. But there was a strong presence in the room of people who live on a subcontinent in which educational and cultural institutions are mostly underfunded, uh, difficult of access. The University of Delhi has 150,000 students. Its students are separated among 68 different colleges in the Delhi area. Uh, the limited library facilities on the campus in North Delhi are, on a good day, an hour's drive away. On a bad day, they're a lot further away from that. They are small, they are cramped, they are crowded. Uh, the vice chancellor whom I met is not sure where they're going to put things and is puzzled by the fact that people seem to need air conditioning when they show up to come and sit in, uh, in libraries as well. And he understands that we believe that the materials also need air conditioning. He doesn't know how he can provide any better facilities than he now provides. For that kind of audience, I can well imagine that there are many very serious people pursuing academic, scholarly, and research topics of considerable importance with the greatest seriousness for whom the internet is as good as or better than any library to which they do themselves genuinely and personally have access. And no amount of pious protesting on my part, uh, no amount of sententious uh, and authoritative statement on the part of those in the room who are holding out for the internet not being a library, will persuade people otherwise. Whatever we do, and however faithfully we continue to carry out the Abbe Migna, the Scipio Maffei, uh, the discovery of manuscripts work that we have practiced for hundreds of years, we are now doing so in an environment that has changed dramatically. We are surrounded by quantities of information beyond our imagining. It's not a 10 to 1 ratio. It's far larger than that. And whatever you imagine the ratio to be now, remember this. It was 15 years ago this month that Netscape Navigator was released for the first time. Uh, Mosaic, the first graphical br web browser, was about a year older than that. Um, I used to say in the talks like this I gave 15 years ago that Netscape was the commercial product with the most rapid market penetration of any product in history within literally weeks. Uh, anyone who had Mosaic had converted to Netscape and copies were morphing throughout the universe. This space in which we imagine ourselves living and whose magnitude we cannot begin to imagine is only 15 years old. We turned on the fire hose. We turned on all the fire hydrants 15 years ago. That's fine. And 150 years from now, please, uh, the length of time that those manuscripts spent sitting on top of the chapter library armoire in Verona, just how much will have come from the fire hose by then? What will it mean in that world to have imagined publishing? What I am struck by as we look forward and think about how journals, serious publications, scholarly publication can and will survive 
is that in a world in which there is a very, very large quantity of poor quality material, there's also going to be a very, very large quantity of, you know, pretty good material. And a very, very large quantity of really quite good, almost good enough material. You can decide for yourselves which of those categories you want to put Wikipedia in based on the last Wikipedia article you read. Differentiating and achieving mind share get from a worldwide audience, including people who don't have the advantages of moving to and fro in Butler Library, when there isn't just the first-rate quality information, but there's also the really quite good quality information and the really almost good enough quality information, and they are all at pains to masquerade for another, does it seems to me impose a new obligation on those who care about the highest quality information? Not simply to distribute it with the appropriate brand and trust the world to come and find it, but to think instead about what it is we have to do in order to bring that to the attention of a wider world. And that seems to me to be potentially destabilizing in an interesting and possibly productive way for learned societies. To think of ourselves as having to market our discipline as much as to represent and guide and protect it is unfamiliar for most of it. What is a problem, what's certainly an issue that librarians with budgets will have to worry about as time goes on, is what the internet has done, has let not just amateurs put things online, but let serious authors put everything online. When I write a paper, I post it online. And then maybe a week later I send it to a journal. Okay. Um, the mechanism, certainly in my field, the mechanism for this has been the ePrint archive which started at Los Alamos and is now at Cornell. You can post a paper there. Uh, there is a minimal filtering. <clears throat> so it's up there, it's freely accessible. Okay. So you might ask, why do we need journals? Why do people want journals? But if you look at the article type things posted on the archive, essentially 100% of them are submitted to journals. The authors do want the peer review. They want the uh, stamp of validity that a journal will give. I looked up the APS data, which is online. Um, the cost per paper, not, not the charge to the, to the library, the actual cost, of, cost to the APS of producing a paper. It's about $850 per submitted paper, which comes to about $1,600 per published paper. And you know, a little bit of that is from uh, physical production of a journal for the places that still actually receive hard copy journals. But most of that is for things, editorial work. Now, most scientific societies, there's a little bit, you know, they actually charge the libraries a little bit more and goes to uh, other activities of the society, education, public affairs. Forget that. Suppose you just wrote that off, said the society can manage somehow to get the money otherwise. There's still a question of how do you pay for the editorial process? doesn't feel to me as though the discipline of classics is twice as large as it was when I was young. Uh, but I do know that I, I'm having trouble um, keeping up with the stuff because there really genuinely is twice as, uh, twice as much of it. Uh, managing that kind of quantity, imagining that kind of quantity forward seems to me to be the real problem that will control what we can do. And pricing by comparison to that uh, to me is um, it's a small issue, it's one that can be worked out empirically, and yeah, I'm all in favor of free, but I'm also all in favor of the people who do this not going broke, because when they go broke, you don't get the information either. <laughs>